Howdy, everybody. Thanks so much for being here with me, y'all. So um, this is the first of of uh, future live streams. This is the first School of Rock remote live stream lesson. So I'm really excited to be here with y'all today and kind of, uh, you know, getting to be the guy who's the, the first one to, to really to do it. So I'm excited. We've been kind of working on this for the last couple of weeks and uh, been working on School of Rock, Rock Remote for a little while and been uh, officially launched School of Rock, at least for my school, about five weeks ago when all this kind of craziness started. So uh, my name is David Thacker. I am based out of Austin, Texas. I work at the Austin, Texas School of Rock. Shout out to everybody at the Austin, Texas School of Rock, all the students and staff. Um, shout out to y'all. Um, so a little bit about me, I've been playing music for about, I've been gigging for about 15 years. I picked up a guitar when I was like 12 or 13 years old and, um, put together a band and started gigging around town when I was 15 and, um, all throughout high school, always played ba through ba in bands all throughout college, always played in bands and it's just been a huge, huge part of my life. Um, I play guitar, bass, drums, vocals, and keyboards, which is everything that we offer at the School of Rock. And I teach all of those at the Austin School of Rock. So um, yeah, I'm generally, uh, when people hit me up to play gigs, I play keyboards, but I love to play all the instruments that, uh, that we offer. So I started working at School Rock, like I said, about three years ago. And um, one of the things that I always thought was so cool was just kind of the the ethos of the school and the way that we went about uh, teaching. So one of the ideas that we, we talk about at School Rock is this idea of a song first approach. So all of our, all of our students are taught with kind of three things in mind. The first is the song first approach. Uh, the second piece of the puzzle is the School of Rock Method app. And then the third piece of the puzzle is the School of Rock Method book. So the Method app is a really cool tool that we launched, I think in 2019, maybe late 2018. And uh, it is basically a tool that allows the student and the teacher to be connected a little bit more. As a teacher, I can assign homework on the app and the app will actually listen and grade the homework without me actually being in the room, which I think is uh, pretty important for a lot of students is to get that feedback right off the bat. Um, yeah, it's, it's awesome. I, uh, I've been kind of everybody, we've all been experimenting more and more with the app and figuring out what, what it's really capable of. And it's a pretty awesome, powerful tool, uh, as a teacher. So the other piece of the puzzle is the school of rock method book. And this is kind of our, again, going back to our, you know, how we standardize teaching these instruments. So again, we teach guitar, bass, drums, vocals, and keyboards. And uh, we, we have five different levels for each of the, each instrument. So it starts at total beginner and then it goes to complete professional uh, level musicianship uh, for all five of those instruments. So um, let's see. Uh, and, then the, and then again, the last is the song first approach. So the idea with the song first approach is we essentially are flipping the traditional model of teaching music on its head. So in general, you would go into a music lesson and maybe you start learning about your scales or you start learning about technique. And then, you know, as you move into it, you actually start learning songs. We kind of do it the reverse way. We learn the song first and then we're going to teach you the relevant theory and technique that you need to play the song because theory and the technique, it's crucial. It's important. And you, you got to have that understanding. But it's kind of a, you know, uh, the idea is by learning the song first, you get to have the enjoyment of playing, playing the song that you actually wanted to learn as well as just kind of the sense of accomplishment. And, uh, and I'm definitely a big believer. I noticed this way before I even taught music is the idea of that. Like if you're having a good time, if you're enjoying yourself while you're learning you, the lessons stick better, you learn better, you end up better on the other side of it. So it's kind of all rolled up into that. And so this is all kind of, um, this is all kind of combined into what we've just put out, which is our school of rock remote. This is something that at least my school has only been doing for about six to five to six weeks. And, um, for sure in my, in my experience, it's been a really amazing program. So we, you know, obviously everything with the way things are with the Corona situation, uh, a lot of families are being asked to stay home and to practice social distancing. And so we want to, on one hand, make sure that we keep our students safe. That's our number one priority. But at the same time, we want to keep their 
their musical education going, and maybe even more importantly, the sense of community that they get at the schools. That's definitely something that uh, for sure at the School of Rock Austin is super, super important is just the sense of community. And I'm sure it's true of every school uh, around the world at School of Rock. And um, so the students have been able to keep that. And I know for me personally, it's kept me sane throughout this whole thing. But I've heard from lots of students, it's the same way, just not only being able to uh, you know, stay engaged with what they were working on, but as well as stay engaged with their, uh, with their instructor and even their, their, their fellow, uh, students by, uh, with, we've got master classes that we've been putting out everything from, uh, everything from songwriting to stagecraft to music theory. I've been doing some music theory master classes over the last four or five weeks and having a lot of fun with them. I got one tonight, uh, if school rock Austin's listening, uh, uh, I think we're talking about the the seven major modes is tonight. Yeah, that's right. So sign up for that. Anyways, um, it's a really cool, it's a cool thing that we got going with the School of Rock Remote. And uh, I've been really excited to be a part of it. Like I said, I've taught, I've taught about a hundred lessons over the last month via remote. And I've been really, really pleasantly impressed with the way that the lessons are pretty much seamless uh, via a camera. So let's see. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I meant to say before we really start the lesson. Um, so like I mentioned before, we have this idea of the song first approach. And with the idea of the song first approach, what we're doing is we're teaching you the song. And then along the way, we're teaching you the relevant theory and technique. So the idea with the lesson that I'm teaching that I'm going to give you all today via this live stream is we're going to go through and we're going to take a song. It's, it's one of the most popular kind of beginner intermediate level songs that we teach at the School of Rock, which is uh, called Seven Nation Army by the White Stripes. I bet most of you guys have heard it. You, maybe you don't know the name, but uh, over the three years of working at School of Rock, every time I've ever played the, the main riff for somebody at the school, they, they recognize the song exactly immediately. So we're going to go through that and I'm going to teach you all each instrument. I'm going to start with guitar, then we're going to move on to bass, then we're going to do vocals, and then we're going to do drums. And I'm going to teach every instrument along the way and talk about the relevant theory as well as the relevant uh, vocabulary, whatever it is that you're gonna need in order to actually play the song from start to finish. So by the end of this, if you happen to have a drum kit, a bass, a guitar, and if you're a singer and you're like, by the end of this, you'll be able to play every single instrument all the way through the whole entire song. So should be pretty fun. Um, we are set up by the way, if anybody is interested in these lessons, uh, you can check out schoolofrock.com slash remote. And you can follow that link. Well, there should be a link somewhere in the description. And if not, you can read it right here on the page, schoolofrock.com uh, school slash remote. And uh, you can set up, sign up for online lessons there. You can sign up and, uh, and, and become a student if you're interested. So, um, and then one other kind of cool thing is at the end of this whole thing, we've put together a video of me playing all of the instruments side by side. So if you want to check that out, you can go to schoolofrock.com slash live lesson. And uh, you can check out the video that we've put together that has a, uh, it's a video of me playing all the instruments and just putting the song all together. So I think that's it. Let's get started. Let's start off with, uh, oh, you know, I said guitar was first, but there's something actually that comes before any instrument that we're going to learn. And this is uh, true of no matter what instrument you play, whether you're playing bass, whether you're playing drums, whether you're playing guitar, vocals, keyboards, doesn't matter. When you learn a song, the first thing that you want to do is you want to, uh, you need to make up what's called a map. So we use this term map. There's a lot of different, a lot of different ways that you could call it, but we use the term map. And basically the idea with the map is that it's, it's just like a roadmap, right? You have a place that you're starting, you have a place that you're ending, and then you have every place along the way. And at any point of the song, you can check in with that map and, and you can tell, okay, well, we just played the verse and now we're gonna play the chorus and now we're gonna play the bridge. And, and, it, and it basically just makes your life easier. It cuts down on the learning, learning curve and it cuts down on the amount of time that you need to spend learning a song in order to learn it. Um, I would say like, I would even be as like ambitious to say that if you have a good map, it could cut down your, the amount of time you spend learning a song by like 75%. So what does a map look like? And what does a map look like, especially for Seven Nation Army? That's really what we're interested in. So I got it up here to my, I guess that's, my, what does it look like on the camera there? It's on, on my right side. 
I've got the seven nation army map. So there's a couple terms that we need to get a little bit familiar with. Probably everyone's comfortable with the idea of an intro, right? This is just the first little part of the song. And this is the, uh, this is usually the first thing in the song. Almost every, most songs have some kind of an intro to them. Uh, in this case, I've put next to the intro that it says just bass, right? So meaning the drum's not playing, the guitar's not playing, nobody else is playing, it's just the bass in that intro. So right after the intro, we have the verse. Now a verse is a lot of times kind of the uh, antithesis to a chorus. So the idea, there's a few different ideas with verses and choruses. And the way that I usually describe verses, uh, verses, choruses, uh, verses in, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Basically, the way that I describe these two ideas of a verse or a chorus is that a verse is usually kind of the tension building part of a song. In general, a verse doesn't have repeating uh, vocal lines. For example, every single verse has a different vo uh, vocal lyric. And uh, the chorus is usually the more releasey kind of part, right? So the, the chorus builds tension, the, I'm sorry, the, the verse builds tension and the chorus releases the tension. And uh, I would also go as far as to say that that's like the only rule in music that I think is 100% you kind of have to follow is you have to build tension and then you have to relieve tension. That's the only rule that I personally would say you can't get away with not doing those two things. So you can get away with anything else, but you have to build tension, you have to relieve tension. And that's kind of what we're doing with the verse and a chorus. So when it comes to Seven Nation Army, um, the verse is the part that he's singing in, okay? So he, and each verse, like I said, each verse has a different lyric, okay? Now, right after the verse is the buildup. The buildup, again, we could maybe think of this as a pre-chorus. This is kind of an additional way to build tension before we get to that chorus, which is the part of the, uh, the really, the release of all that tension and the part that just feels really good. And a lot of times in songs, it'll, you know, it's the part where the lyrics stay the same. You know, it's the part where, uh, it's the, it's the memorable lyric that everybody knows is in the chorus. And part of that is because it makes you feel good and you remember it. And, uh, and it's that release of all that tension. And so if you, if you look through this map, as we go through this map, we have the intro, we have the verse, we have a buildup, we have a chorus, and then you'll notice on the other end of that chorus, we have another buildup. So that's something to keep in mind. Every single time we have a chorus, we have the, uh, it's bookended on either side by a buildup. And then if you continue on with the, uh, with the map, you have a verse after the buildup, you have a second verse, right? Verse two, then you have another buildup chorus uh, build up. I think I forgot to put that in there actually. Um, and then you have a third verse and then you have a build up chorus build up. So what we're going to do also too, maybe just something to keep in mind and pay attention to is our second chorus, right? It says times two there. It's twice as long as the first chorus. That's crucial. These are things to add into your map, right? Uh, some maps that will be more detailed than this. Maybe you actually count out the exact number of bars in each verse or something like that. I'm not going to go through that today, but um, I'm a big believer in listening to the song and finding it rather than finding it by listening to it and feeling it. This is just me personally, rather than counting it out. Counting it out is a great way, but to me, it's kind of the I, I try to feel it and hear it before I count it out. And I think most of y'all, especially with this song, could just feel this and count it out. So uh, the verse lasts as long as he's singing. The buildup is going to be obvious to hear. And then the chorus is in between the buildups. So, um, yeah, I think that's everything you need to know about the map. Uh, something I kind of had forgotten to mention is I will be taking questions. So I'll try to check in with the chat. And if anybody has any questions, it looks like we're getting... Um, it looks like we're getting, uh, quite a few message or comments and I'll see if I can, uh, respond to some of them. I did notice somebody said, uh, somebody said no keyboards. And in this song, there actually are no keyboards. So for this lesson, we decided to leave them out, uh, in future lessons. I'm sure we'll include some keyboards. Um, let's see here. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's get to it. Let's uh, let's actually start learning some stuff. So I'm gonna get rid of this. Um, I'm gonna get rid of the. Let's see. I'm gonna get rid of the map for a second. 
and I am going to pick up the guitar. So the guitar is what we're going to learn first. So first we're going to go over a couple relevant, um, a couple relevant pieces of, uh, let's see if we can hear this. Yep. We're going to go over a couple relevant pieces of vocabulary that you're going to need to know in order to, uh, in order to play the guitar or, in it, or no, really in order to get something out of this lesson. The first is the concept of frets. So a fret, as you can see, let me switch to my fancy close-up fretboard camera. Hopefully it's lined up nicely, yeah. Uh, okay, so the frets are these vertical lines here, perpendicular to the string, you see these frets. Now, uh, we number the frets. So this is the first fret, second fret, third fret, fourth fret, fifth fret, you get the idea. So um, a real quick, easy way to know which fret you're on is to know that in general, for most guitars and most basses, the dots start on the third fret and they go on the odd numbers. So you have the third fret, fifth fret, seventh fret, ninth fret. Now the double dot down there is kind of a little different. The double dot is actually the 12th fret. And this is the octave, uh, this is the octave fret, meaning it's the same note, it's just one octave up. Right, so this is E, and this is also E. Uh, so that's frets. And um, a, uh, okay, so secondly is you're definitely gonna need to know the names of the strings. So the best way that I know to remember the names of the strings, this is from one of the School of Rock Austin instructors named Ahmed. He's an absolute legend, and uh, he teaches them like this. It's Eddie A Dynamite, Goodbye Eddie. So E A D G B E, Eddie A Dynamite, Goodbye Eddie. Um, those are the names of the strings, and it's absolutely crucial to know the names of the strings because I'm gonna be saying the seventh fret of the A string, and you need to know that that's, boom, right there. A string is the second string, and the seventh fret is the, the seventh fret, right? You just count up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, I think that's everything you need to know for this tune, probably so. Uh, if I remember, I'll, I'll, if I remember something in a second, I'll, I'll chime back in and say something about it. So, so there's one more, actually there is one more concept that we kind of need to talk about. And this is the idea of a type of notation called tablature. So tablature is basically a fancy way of saying it's a music notation that uh, is good for guitar music or bass music or really any fretted instrument. It's uh, it's great for that. So, so I'm going to put up a guitar tab for the main, this is the main riff of seven nation army. Now, um, this guitar tab is actually directly out of our School of Rock method app. So this is one of the things that you can, I've, I've, photo, or I've uh, screenshotted it and I've just put the relevant piece in there, but in the, uh, in the app you can go through and the entire song's in there and it's all tabbed out and it's all corded out. And there's actually standard notation as well. If you are, if you are a standard notation music reader, you can, uh, you can look at it in standard notation as well. But the idea with tabs is you see these horizontal lines going across the screen. Those horizontal lines represent the strings. Now, if you're counting at home, you can see there's six lines there, right? Just like there's six strings on the guitar. So the lowest string or the lowest line is the low string on your guitar, the low E. Uh, the second line is your A string, second string. So as you see there on the tab, you see it says seven, seven, 10, seven, five, three, two. Now that those numbers represent the frets, right? So the lines represent the strings and the numbers actually represent the frets. So what you're going to play for this main riff of seven nation army, I'm just going to play it for you real quick at, at normal tempo and normal timing. Sound familiar, but probably all of y'all have heard that riff before. So, so here's the deal. As far as you know, sitting down and learning this this as a guitar player, if you're sitting there and you're a total beginner and you and you learn this, I'll tell you the odds are that there's one issue that is your biggest issue, and that is getting a good note out of the guitar. So what I mean by getting a good note out of the tar guitar is oftentimes when you first start learning the guitar, it kind of hurts your fingers. Maybe for the first week it hurts your fingers. If you put in enough practice after a couple days or a week, it doesn't hurt your fingers anymore. But at first it kind of does. 
So what a lot of times beginner guitar students will do is they'll, they won't push down on the fret hard enough and they'll get to sound like this. Hopefully y'all can hear that okay, but it's basically this kind of like ghostly sort of almost note. And then like as they push a little bit harder, they get, it gets a little bit better, still not great. And then when you just finally push hard enough, you get this nice sound out of your guitar. So this is something that you wanna start asking yourself. You wanna start asking yourself, okay, what sound, how, how are the sounds that I'm making out of this guitar sounding? Am I getting a good note or not? And only you can really answer that. And so you gotta kinda of just, I mean, well, only you can answer that when you're sitting at home right now. So you gotta just ask that and you gotta kinda of hold yourself accountable to getting a good note out of it. Um, so then the second thing I would say is, you know, this riff, to some people, maybe this riff seems simple, but to a total beginner, this riff might, might seem very complex. So what I wanna introduce is this idea that I basically tell all my students, which is that there's no such thing as going too slow and there's no such thing as simplifying a riff too much. So if you wanna learn the most complicated piece of music on the planet, I, I really believe that anybody could learn the most, well, maybe not the most complicated piece, but an exceptionally complicated piece. Anybody's capable of learning that. But the only way you can do that is you have to slow it way down and you have to simplify it. So what do I really mean by that? I mean. In terms of this riff, let's go back to the riff. In terms of this riff, right, maybe you need to just focus on, you might even need to just focus on one single note. You might need to focus on one note and getting a good note out of that note. Maybe you need to focus on just the seven, seven, ten, seven. Right, if you can't get that to sound good right off the bat, slow it down and just focus on just that for a little bit. Right? After you've completely mastered that, after that's just drilled into your brain, move on. Right? If the if the rhythm is giving you trouble, don't don't worry so much about the rhythm. Just focus on nailing uh, or nailing it with no rhythm. So just don't worry about the rhythm later. Just simplify it, slow it down, and um, and and. Uh, and then, and then push the tempo up once you've got it nailed. Now that is the main riff. I don't know if I even really explain that, but that is the main riff, okay? So when we talk about the verse, uh, the verse is this, right? It's this seven, seven, 10, seven, five, three, two, with this particular rhythm. Now let's talk about the buildup. Uh, build, uh, in the buildup, this is where we're going to introduce an idea uh, called a chord. So a chord is basically any time you're playing uh, multiple notes at the exact same time. Um, when you're playing a, when you're playing multiple notes at the same time, it's called a chord. And um, in the case of Seven Nation Army, the chord that you're going to play is called a power chord. Now the cool thing about a power chord is that it's very easily transposable, and what that means is you can play it anywhere on the neck, and it'll still sound like a power chord. So let's switch to my fancy close up fretboard camera and I'm just going to show you let's do it like this I'm going to show you what a power chord looks like how the shape works so the first one you're going to play is a G power chord G is the third fret of E and what you're going to do is you're going to simultaneously play the third fret of E and the fifth fret of A now that shape and by shape I mean you know, if you, if you held your fingers just like this and slid them anywhere up and down the neck, right? So one string back, two frets up simultaneously. This is called a power chord. You can play this power chord anywhere on the neck. You can even move it up a string. You can even move it up two strings. Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hun thousands and thousands and thousands of songs, contemporary rock and roll songs are made up of power chords. Okay, so everyone knows that, right? Blitzkrieg bop. So, um, okay, so the buildup, it's gonna go like this. You're gonna do a G power chord. You're doing eighth notes there. So just count to eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right? Really, the, the right way to count to it be one and two and three and four and. And then you're going to go to an A power chord, which is just two frets up. Same strings to the A power chord. Again, eight eighth notes. One and two and three. That's the whole buildup section, okay? Not too complicated for the buildup. Let's go back to my other cam. 
Okay, so um, so that's your that's your build up section. I'm gonna go back to the um, back to the map. So at this point, we have done the verse, we've done the build up, and now let's look at the chorus. The chorus is very similar to the verse. Uh, the first part of the uh, chorus actually is the same exact riff as the verse. So the chorus is gonna go like this. I'm gonna just play it for you, and then I'll explain it. notice the first the first riff is exactly the same as the verse riff the second riff is slightly different and it's it's based on all the same notes it's just a little bit of a re, uh, reorganization of those notes so the first riff seven seven ten seven five three two the second riff seven seven ten seven five three you're going to go back to five five back to three three two so again that second half seven seven ten seven five three five three two okay um and then that's and then that whole section happens twice right so that's one here's two back to the build up Okay, so that's all of the parts of the tune, uh, with the exception of the guitar solo. So um, if there's time at the end of the stream, I'm going to come back and teach the guitar solo. But as of now, I'm not going to teach it because I don't know if I have time right this second. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the bass guitar. Uh, and I'm going to check the chat. If y'all have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and, uh, and I'll do my best to answer them. All right, let's check the chat. Let's see how is everybody doing. These live streams are always just so. I, I've done a few live streams. Um, I've done a few live streams, just live stream concerts like this, and they're always a little bit uh, bizarre because I'm, you know, just in here by myself, and then I, um, I'm in here by myself, and then I just turn on the live, and then I go, and like, there's always a little bit like, is it working? Is everything going? Um, Okay, so I did just I just see a message from Nisha Alexander saying, "Will there be a session for those with acoustic guitar?" This is a really good question. So, um, actually, with the acoustic guitar, it's the it's basically the same as the electric guitar. I'll tell you the big difference um, in general, like practically for most uh, students, when there is a acoustic guitar, is oftentimes the acoustic guitar strings are going to be a little higher up off the fretboard than electric guitar strings. And they might even be a heavier gauge, meaning a thicker string, which basically means um, just from a physical perspective, it might be just slightly more difficult at first to play just um, in terms of getting a good note out of it. That's not to say that, you know, you shouldn't play acoustic guitar. I love playing acoustic guitars. Um, but that is really the only, at least in my opinion, the, the big difference between an acoustic and electric in terms of learning. The notes are all the same. The theory is all the same. The technique's all the same. Um, maybe slightly different technique, but I don't know. You could probably pick that apart. So anyways, um, so yeah, good question. Let's see here. Sound and video is great. Watching from South Africa. Wow, that's really cool. Um, awesome. Very, very cool. How do we know which strings to use for both hands? Oh man, I'm sorry, Susan. I don't know if I understand the question. How do you know which strings to use for both hands? So I'm going to try to answer. So uh, maybe, so essentially you're, you're plucking the same string that you're fretting. So if you're fretting the second, if you're on, for example, on seven nation army, you're fretting that second string. And that means you need to pluck the same string that you're fretting. So, okay. So let's, let's go ahead and move on to the bass. Appreciate y'all's questions. Um, I'm going to get rid of the map for just a second. So, so this is a bass. It might look a little weird to some of y'all. Uh, maybe you notice right off the bat, it has more strings than a normal bass. Uh, so this is a six string bass. 
Uh, traditional basses, I'd say the most common type of bass is a four string bass. The way that a six string bass works is that the middle four strings are the same as a normal bass and the bottom string and the top string are uh, additional strings that a normal four string bass doesn't have. So, uh, so the, so on a normal bass, your strings are still tuned E, A, D, G, right? Eddie, eight, dynamite, good. We don't have bi and we don't have Eddie on a bass. Uh, in my case, my lowest note is a B, it's a low B. And, um, as a bass player, personally, I love having that low B. Um, I wouldn't go without it, but uh, I, but then it's E, A, D, G, and then the highest note, this is a little unorthodox, but I tune it to a B as well. So anyways, uh, hopefully this doesn't confuse anybody. I'm going to be really only sticking on these middle four strings, which again are E, A, D, G, just like a guitar. Now, um, the, uh, the technique of playing a bass, it's again, real similar to a guitar. I mean, a bass is a type of guitar, right? It's a bass guitar. Uh, the main difference is generally you play a bass with your fingers, with two fingers, uh, instead of a pick right now, definitely some bass players pay, play with the pick. And if you want to play with the pick, that's great. Personally, I think I like to play with my fingers and I encourage my students to at least be able to play with their fingers, uh, regardless of if they have a preference to play with the pick, it's totally cool if you want to play with the pick, but. I like to play with my fingers. It, it makes me feel more connected to the bass. Uh, and all you really want to do is it's kind of like you're just doing a little power walk with your fingers there. Right. Um, and you're just, you know, I, I just go one, two, one, two. Right. And I, you know, I like to anchor my thumb to the pickup here. Some basses have a little thing that sits on them that you can put your thumb on. You don't even have to do that. You, you can get, get away without anchoring it. Uh, but personally, I like to do that. Um, otherwise I think that's really it. That's the base for you. So, um, you know, uh, frets, all the frets are still, the, um, the, the idea behind the frets is still the same. All the notes are the same as long as you're talking about the same string. And, um, uh, yeah, so let's, let's go through it. Let's go, let's get back to the map. So you'll see on the intro, uh, that's only bass, right? So the bass riff is what starts off the whole song. Oops. And this is exactly the same as the guitar riff. So I'm actually going to bring that guitar riff uh, back up just for one brief second and show you guys that we're looking at seven, seven, ten, seven, five, three, two. And this is again on the A string of your bass. So if you're using a four string bass, this is the second string of your bass. Again, I want to just emphasize that there's no such thing as slowing it down too much, and there's no such thing as as um, as simplifying it too much. So if you're struggling with playing that riff, don't feel like you need to play it as fast as I just played it. 99% of the time, when I'm in a lesson with a student and I demonstrate a riff to them, I'm doing it at full speed just so that we can get through it quickly and so that that they can give it a try. And 99% of the time, they listen to me playing at full speed and they think, "Oh, I need to play it at full speed." You don't need to play these riffs at full speed to start off, right? This is a pro this is something you progress to. It's not something that you just wake up and you're just going to have the riff down. Um, whether it's a simple or a complicated riff, when I start learning a riff personally, still to this day, I'm working on a set right now actually. Um, and when I learn a new song, sometimes I kick it down as little as half speed. You know, just. demonstrate that just to let you know that there's no such thing as slowing it down too much. There's no such thing as, uh, making it too simple. So, okay. That's the verse. Uh, pretty, pretty straightforward. The buildup again is very much along the lines of what the guitar is doing. So the buildup is going to go, uh, it's just going to go eighth notes on G and then eighth notes on a. And, um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and, uh, and then you're right back into the verse or I'm sorry, into the riff. Um, so now let's talk about the chorus. That's the build up. And remember the build up is on either side of these. So let's talk about the, the chorus. Okay. So I'm going to put up a, another tab here. So now this is a uh, this is a tab that's specifically made for bass, right? You can see that it's only got four strings, 
And you may also see that we're now we're using the low E string. And the reason why I wanted to include this is to talk about the idea of voicing. So the idea of voicing on a guitar, essentially, or rather, whether or not you're playing it on a guitar or on, on a keyboard or whatever, uh, it's the idea of playing a riff or a, or a melodic idea in a, in a slightly different way. In the case of the bass and the guitar, one of the kind of cool things about these instruments is you can play the same notes on multiple parts of the instrument. So, um, so right here we've got, it starts off with this seven, 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 ten, seven. And what you see there is it goes down to the low E string. And this is 10, eight, 10, eight, seven. So I guess I should, um, I guess that we should go back just one second, right? This is assuming you've already played the, the main riff, right? So just a refresher in the chorus. Right, that's the first part of the riff. Here's the second part of the riff. And here we're playing it in a slightly different place. The idea here as well is, let me get rid of this for a second so I can demonstrate something. The idea is you want to avoid this kind of movement really as much as possible. This is These are big movements right here. There's this idea of economy of motion, and this goes for all instruments. You want to be as relaxed and move as little as possible. So by voicing it this way, you can see we're moving minimally in this direction, and we're moving only in this direction. Um, let me put that bass tab back up one more time. Okay, and so this is this is the idea we're talking about. So we start on the A string, seven, seven, ten, seven, and then we're gonna go down 10, eight, 10, eight, seven. And this is, just to kind of tie it all together, this is the exact same riff the guitar is playing, and we're just simply playing it on a different part of the bass. So that's the chorus, and that is the, um, and that's the end of all of the bass parts. So let's go back to the map. Uh, so we've talked about the intro, right? Which really is the same as the verse. It's the main riff. We've talked about the verse, which is again, the main riff just repeated over and over again. Uh, we've talked about the buildup, which is the eighth notes on G followed by the eighth notes on A. And then we've talked about the chorus, which is the two main riffs kind of back to back. Um, now again, kind of going back to the idea of the map at this point, because we've learned all of these sections of the song, we can now go in and we can plug these in each part of the song. And once you know the verse, well, well, the verse stays the same for the verse one, verse two, and verse three of the bass. And, uh, the chorus stays the same for chorus one and chorus two and chorus three of the bass. The buildups always stay the same. So once you know those parts, you simply go in and you plug them in where they belong. Uh, so that's the bass. I think that's everything I want to talk about in the bass. Um, real quick, I'm going to give you all one more reminder that uh, if you're, or another reminder that if you're interested in our School of Rock remote lessons, you can go to schoolofrock.com slash remote and check out our remote lessons uh, and sign up for remote lessons. Like I, like I mentioned at the beginning, um, we, we, or our school, my school here in Austin has been doing remote lessons for about six weeks now. And it's been a really cool, um, really cool thing. So, okay, now we're gonna, uh, let me check the chat real quick while we're switching in between instruments. Let's see what you guys been saying. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Let's see here. Somebody asked why my bass has six strings. Well, uh, in general, I personally don't really need that highest string. Let me bring this back up. So we have, remember we, we have E, or sorry, we have B on the on this low string, and then the middle four strings are basically a normal bass. And then that top string I also have tuned to B. I could totally do away with this top string. I don't need the top string, I don't care. I bought the, I really bought the bass because I thought it sounded great and because it was a reasonable price. But I do love having this low, low B string down here. And, um, I think even if I played a, a four string bass, I think I would tune it B E uh, A D, but that's just me. That's a personal preference. I love having that low note. I already unplugged it, but uh, having that low B, especially as a bass player and I play a lot of funk bass. So um, it's great to have that really, really low end. Um, okay. So let's see here. 
uh cool getting a lot of getting a lot of shout outs in the uh chat really appreciate you guys tuning in with me and, and listening here um somebody asked about a drum set we are going to talk about drum set in just a second i have a drum set set over there and i'll i'll definitely be explaining all that um da, 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 da. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to go ahead and move on. I'm going to talk about vocals for a second. Uh, someone asked about the guitar solo for, um, someone asked about the guitar solo for seven nation army. Uh, I'll try to get through this quick quickly and then I'll come back and hit the guitar solo at the end. Okay. Um, let's see. All right. Let's go to vocals. Now vocals. I kind of thought about vocals a lot for this and Vocals are one of those things that it's great when I am in the room with you and I can hear you and give you feedback. It's a little bit tougher when when I'm not speaking to you, even even not being in the room with you, I should say, digitally being in the room with you. I've taught a bunch of vocal lessons via School of Rock Remote and they work really, really well. But the, the thing that works really, really well with those vocal lessons is the feedback. The student can then sing for me and I can hear what they sound like. Um, so the thing that's weird about, or the thing that's interesting and kind of cool about vocals is that, um, you are controlling your voice with your entire body. So in the same way that when I learned piano, I am practicing controlling my fingers. You need, you, you're essentially your goal with that in the, uh, learning vocals is to learn to control your respiratory muscles, learn to control your diaphragm. That's what your respiratory muscles are called is your diaphragm and learn to feel what it feels like to sing the note that you want to sing. And it's, it's a weird, wild journey of learning to sing, but it's really, really cool. And um, it's all essentially about learning to use your own body. So what I thought I would do with this time to talk about vocals is I thought I would talk about um, the two most common issues that vocals, vocalists have and then how to deal with those issues. So the two most common issues that vocalists tend to have is first is uh, either projection or really not first. They're like, literally it's like 50, 50. Most students have one or the other. Uh, one is projection issues and the other is pitch issues. So projection is essentially the idea of engaging those respiratory muscles when you go to sing, as well as really pushing air through past your vocal cords when you sing. So when you sing, you know, think about how it feels to sing when you're singing in the car by yourself and you know nobody is watching and you're just belting it and you're really going for it. And then think about the difference between that and singing um, when you know that somebody's in the room next to you listening, right? So you can kind of, I'm gonna fight them all. A seven nation army couldn't hold me back. Right, I'm kind of making a pitch and I'm kind of singing, but I'm not really singing. On the other hand, I'm gonna fight them off. A seven nation army couldn't hold me back. So the idea between those two is one of them. I'm, I'm pushing a lot of air. My volume is up, but volume really isn't the only thing that's different between those two, right? I'm engaging more of my diaphragm on the second example, and I'm pushing more air past my vocal cords on the second example. So if you have projection issues, um, one of it, part of it is mental. Part of it is you have to allow yourself to be vulnerable enough to project it. That's just part of, it that you can't get away from. And the other, the other more practical way, uh, to, um, to deal with it is an exercise called lip trills, which I think is one of my favorite exercises vocally on the planet. And lip trills just sound like this. So all you're doing is you're, you're blowing air with a closed mouth and letting your lips vibrate like that. Now, um, the, uh, the reason why that exercise is really good is because as you blow air past your lips, you can't keep your lips vibrating like that unless you're blowing sufficient air past your lips. So you can't cheat yourself. You can't not, I mean, you can't not push air when you do these lip trills. So find whatever song it is. If it's seven nation army, whatever your song is that you want to sing and practice singing through it with lip trills. <laughs> right that's seven nation army with lip trills you give it any song you want it really doesn't matter um if you know some scales or some arpeggios on your piano you can you can uh sing along with those with lip trills but the 
idea there is you're training your body to what it feels like to push air through a note. So that'll help you a lot with projection issues. The other one is pitch issues. And the, the deal with pitch is um, pitch is a little bit tougher, but it's I've seen people do amazing things with their pitch. People who had an extremely difficult time singing a single note in tune, um, doing a lot better with their pitch. So it, it helps a lot to have some kind of a vocal warm up. And uh, there's some vocal warm ups in the School of Rock Method app, for example. Um, but the idea is just kind of singing through some scales or singing through some arpeggios. So um, every day that I teach a vocal lesson, every vocal lesson I teach, we start with a warm up, which maybe is just some arpeggios, maybe some scales. Sing through those notes. Sing through them also with different vowel sounds as well. Um, singing through them with different vowel sounds is really important. You may find that when you sing with an ah sound that you can hit every pitch along the way. And then when you sing with an O oh sound, maybe you can't hit it. Maybe you can't hit the pitches as well. So it's kind of a, it's almost like a stretching or a workout routine of getting yourself really comfortable with, uh, singing in all vowel sounds. So the last piece of the puzzle for pitch that I would say, um, that I've seen students use, uh, that really helped them out is downloading some kind of a tuner and literally you know playing a note on the piano and then trying to find that note with your voice and holding the tuner up and seeing where you're at and this is going back to that of what i was talking about of that it's this matter it's a matter of learning to control your own physiology and it's a matter of okay let me explore and experiment with different ways that i can sing this note like maybe you're flat maybe you're 10 cents flat well you need to experiment with how can i make that needle go up to the center, right? If it's a tuner that has a needle type of situation. Um, and as you do that, you got to pay real close attention to your body and what's changing with your body in order to make that needle go to the in tune section. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the drum. So let me make sure my fancy drum cam is working here. Let's see. looks like it's working. Okay. Looks like we got it going. Okay, I'm going to go over to the drums. All right. Okay, thanks for bearing with me. This is like, I got more cables and stuff running around this apartment right now than ever in my entire life. So uh, quarantine, I used to have nightmares about cables actually when I was first, hopefully y'all can hear me okay. Yeah, it looks like you can. Um, nice. Yeah, when I first started learning to record and all that and just got started getting into instruments and just had all these instruments and cables and stuff, I used to have nightmares about being wrapped in cables. And those haven't gone away. Okay. Um, okay. So for the drum set, a uh, couple quick pieces of um, vocabulary. This is called a tom. This is called a crash. This is called a snare. This is called a bass drum. This is with my, uh, with my left leg. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. My right leg. Don't, don't know my left from my right. Um, yeah. That's all you really need. Tom, crash, snare, bass drum. So let's start with the verse. We'll go back to that. Um, we'll go back to the uh, 
I'm not able to turn on my map, but we start with the intro, drums don't play in the intro. We go to the verse, drums start playing right on the verse. The drums on the verse, it's real nice and straightforward. You're gonna play your bass drum and your tom at the same time. And you're gonna play, you're gonna count to four, okay? This idea of counting to four is crucial as a drummer. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Um, getting comfortable counting while you're playing is also something that might be worth your time. If, if it's complicated, again, slow it way down. One, two, three, four. Now, as soon as he comes in with that, and I'm talking to myself at night because I can't forget. As soon as he comes in with that, you're gonna add the snare. What you're gonna do is you're gonna add the snare on the two and on the four. This is a really common snare pattern. So you keep everything over here going one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, so again, um, if that's complicated, slow it way down. Maybe you need to just, maybe you need to not worry about the bass drum for at first and just. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And then add in that bass drum once you're comfortable. Again, slowing it way down if you need to. That's the verse, that's the whole verse, right? So the first half of the verse is just this. Second half of the verse, Um, that's, that's, that's it. That's for the verse for the buildup. The buildup is nice and straightforward as well. It's all based on quarter notes, one, two, three, four, and we're going to hit the crash on the one. And then we're going to hit the, uh, the bass drum and the Tom on the one, two, three, four. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That's the whole buildup right there. Now the, um, the, that's the, that's the verse and that's the buildup. Let's talk about the chorus real quick. And that's, that's the whole tune right there. So with the chorus, the chorus is the most complicated part. It starts off relatively straightforward because it starts off just like the verse or, well, it starts off with the verse. It starts off very much like the verse when you're playing with the two and the four on the snare, except instead of hitting the, the tom, you're hitting the. Uh, the crash. So you're going to go one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Now something that is a little bit different about this is that your bass drum now is only falling on the one and three. So one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. And any any drum people out there, just so you know, I just found this out about these these uh, symbols is they actually do quiet down when you grab them. Kind of cool. This is just a you know a cheap uh, cheap drum set I rented a long time ago that I just forgot to give back before the lockdown. Anyways, um, let's see. Okay, so so that's the beginning of the chorus, right? Just one, two, three, four. Bass drum on the one and the three. Snare on the one and, on the two and the four. And crash on one, two, three, four. Now what's a little bit weird is you're gonna do two bars of that. And then you're gonna do a half bar of that followed by this little triplet pattern. So what that is, is it's your bass drum and your crash at the same time, just one, two, three. Or, yeah, like that. One, two, three, one. So you do the first one and two are on crash and bass drum at the same time, and then the three is on your snare. Uh, your snare. So the way it'll sound is like this. And that is one half of the entire chorus, right? So one more time, two full bars, counting all the way to four with, uh, with no weirdness, and then a half bar counting to two with no weirdness, and then one half bar count, uh, with weirdness, and then one full bar with no weirdness. So here we go. One, two, three, four. Two, two, three, four. One, two. One, two, three, four. And that's really it. That's it for the whole uh, drum section and that's it for really the whole song. So um, I'm gonna go hop back over there. I think I have enough time to really quickly teach the guitar solo. 
So I'm going to try to do that in my last couple of minutes. And I'm back. Okay, guitar. Now I'm gonna do this pretty quickly because I don't have a whole lot of time left. And before I do, I am just gonna say one more quick time. If you're interested in School of Rock remote lessons, you can follow schoolofrock.com remote and sign up for online lessons there. And um, yeah, we're, uh, we're, it's, it's been a really cool experience to get to kind of spearhead the School of Rock remote stuff. Um, okay, so, and then lastly, one more thing I want to say is if you are interested in seeing the video of me putting all of these instruments together, um, uh, there's a video that we put together that has me playing guitar, drums, bass, vocals, all at the same time playing this song. So if you want to cross reference with what we've talked about today and play through the song yourself, that's, that's totally possible and doable. So, so that is that. I'm just going to leave this up for the rest of the time. Okay, so now for this guitar solo, I'm going to teach it to y'all real quickly. And I'm just going to assume that if you want to know the guitar solo, hopefully you're, uh, you're going to be able to pick this up quick because we're running a little bit low on time right now. So I'm going to play the guitar solo for you first, and then I'll teach it to you. So it goes like this. see that there's a lot of repetition there now the first riff goes like this it's going to be on the the ninth fret of the it's the ninth fret of the uh what is that of the g string and it's going to go up to the 12th fret and then it's going to play the 11th so it's going to go like this 9 9 12 9 9 12 11 9 9 12 9 9 12 14 12 11 it repeats that whole thing again 12, 9, 9, 12, 11, 9, 9, 12, 9, 9, 12, 14, 12, 11. Then we're going to move that exact same shape, the, basically the exact same riff. I mean, it is the same riff. It's an octave up to the 12th fret of the E string and the 15th fret of the E string. So you're going to go 12, 12, 15, 12, 12, 15, 14, 12, 12, 15, 12, 12, 15, 17, 15, 14. Now this is the part that gets a little weird. 12, 12, 15, 12, 12, and then you're gonna do a whole step bend. And then unbend it before you go to the 14. And then to end it out, you're gonna go 12, 12, 15, 12, 12, 15, 12, now 13 on the B string, and 12 on the B string. That's how it ends. Then you go right into the build up. Okay, so I'm going to check the chat one more time, but that's basically it. That's basically what I got for you guys today. I really appreciate everybody that tuned in and and, uh, and said what's up on the chat. Let's see. Um, shout out to School of Rock ATX one more time. Um, will there be more of these live streams? I think um, there. the plan is to do more um, live streams, yes. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll kind of let you guys know. Uh, let's see here. Any last minute questions? Um, ch -ch 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 -ch. Uh, looks like a lot of love in the chat. Not too many terribly uh, tough questions. Um, not Or not too many questions in general, I mean to say. Uh, the drum segment, Emil, did just happen. Hopefully you were tuned in for that. 
Um, yeah, I think that is going to be it. So um, I'm going to go ahead and sign off one more time. If you're interested in the lessons, uh, check out School of Rock Remote. And uh, if you're interested in seeing the video, let me put this up like this so you can actually see both at the same time. You can see the video of me playing all the instruments at the same time on the schoolofrock.com slash live lesson. And you can uh, sign up for lessons yourself via School of Rock Remote. We're doing private lessons uh, via remote learning. And um, yeah, thanks so much for tuning in, y'all. And I'll see y'all on the next one.